Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. The texts for July 19, uh, 2020 are Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading is Genesis 28, 10 through 19a. Uh, the Psalm is Psalm 86, 11 through 17. Uh, the second reading is Romans 8, 12 through 25, and the gospel is Matthew 13, 24 to 30, and 36 to 43. This is, the, this is the parable I always start with when I teach on Matthew's gospel to people. People always want to say, tell me what makes Matthew distinctive. This is where I begin. Why? Great. It's a quintessential Matthew parable. Why? Oh, because Why? you've got, well, you've got anxiety as part of it. This is a very anxious gospel. Here you have anxiety about these, these, uh, these counterfeits, these, these weeds that, that don't belong there with the wheat, which you see in other places in Matthew. You will get this with a wedding banquet. We'll get this with the bridesmaids. We'll get this with sheep and the goats variety of places. You get this in Jesus' criticism of the, of the leadership. Uh, and the response here is to wait. It is not your job. And so you've got this strong sense of judgment at the end as well. So we're about that point in year A where if you haven't started talking about judgment and how it figures in the gospel according to Matthew, uh, it's time to get started because it's just going to keep ramping itself up from now through November. But it's just kind of quintessential Matthew. It's only in this gospel. It's, it seeks to describe a community that is not just divided or that sees itself over against another community, I think historically, but also has an anxiety of how do we really know who's true and who's false? How do we really know who our siblings in Christ are and who are not? So I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. This is a for me, this has just been a great gospel to work with in the last three and a half years of my life, as I think the church in the United States has become about as polarized as politics in the United States. And it's very difficult to figure out who my Christian kin are some days of the week, with whom I want to be identified, who's dangerous, not just who, but what teachings are dangerous, those kinds of things create an anxiety in the church that sometimes expresses itself up in the hope of judgment in, in imagery of violence or of cutting people off. And here at least is a parable that says, cool down a bit. Yeah, there's danger out there, but ultimately that's God's thing to worry about and, and not your own. And in trying the best, the best detail of this little parable is in endeavoring to uproot the weeds, you're going to damage the wheat. This is a gospel that frequently talks about people of little faith, that, that recognizes the fragility of faith, that even commends little faith. Little faith is enough faith in Matthew's scheme of things. But little faith also has a fragility about it, and it can be destroyed by those who are perhaps too zealous to, um, to root out uh, the false ones or those who are too zealous to take what belongs to God and claim that work as their own. I think one thing that's really interesting too about, uh, and I, I appreciate, I appreciate that. And then also uh, the, the commentary on the website points to the reality that it's easy then to vilify the enemies or it's easy to it in our, in our own constructs, our own, uh, measurability than to say, you know, th this is, this is the, this is the weeds, these are the weeds and this is the wheat. And then how quickly uh, we are uh, prone to do that. And I think one of the really interesting things about narratively how this, how this gets set up is that you don't get the ex exclamation or explanation uh, until you get two more parables about, about the kingdom. And so it's a way that Matthew, you know, literarily or narratively makes you wait, uh, but then also throws in these parables that you're like, wait, a mustard seed, wait, a, you know, wait, yeast. And, and so of this, you know, the invisibility, right, of the greatness of God's kingdom. And so it's just, it's a way to kind of 
uh, you know, a, a way to put that before us to say, no, you don't get to do this right away, or you don't get to say that's an enemy and that's not, and that's a weed and that's not like uh, right away. You have to, you have to, uh, and how, and so I think I would spend some time with that too, is that like Matthew makes you wait for the, <laughs> or Jesus makes you wait for the excla- explanation and, uh, and how, again, how does that shine light on our human condition or the nature of our human condition to, uh, to label persons as enemies and to, uh, to quickly weed out, you know, to weed out quickly what we think is dangerous and what we think is uh, safe. And so, uh, yeah, I would spend a little bit of time, again, with that, uh, that calling out of our own propensities for that behavior. I love that. And in putting, um, calling out my own propensity, I, I always try to challenge my um, students to know their audience. And Jesus here breaks that rule. He's speaking to fishermen about farming. In light of what both of you have just said, what occurs here is that um, Jesus creates this moment where you ha- those who we would think understand have to scratch their head and have to say, uh, hey, Jesus, can you like explain this to us? And how often do we get to the point where we think we know the answers already? And this is a reminder for us that no matter where we are on the journey, um, no matter how we identify ourselves, we need to be able to stop and lean in and listen again for what it is God is saying to us now in this moment, even with a very familiar word. And as the commentary notes uh, toward the end, is, uh, with and particularly with the with the uh, delay of the householder, but uh, but relatedly, allow us time to reflect on whether we are wheat or weeds. Uh, that that how quickly there are our uh, our assessment turns outside of ourselves rather than inside of ourselves. And I think, I think uh, particularly in, in, um, in, in the wake of, of COVID-19 and then also the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, that this, this absolute necessity of, of that turning inside and um, for deep, honest reflection about what is the kingdom of God? How do I live out the kingdom of God? How am I the salt of the world and the, you know the salt of the earth and the light of the world? Uh, it's uh, it's that you know that judgment is not judgment or that moment of crisis is not just outside of ourselves but should be an internal one as well. And in answering that question, the questions you raised, Caroline, of uh, how how are we the salt of the earth? You know how are we uh, offering that good news. That the, another line from uh, the commentary that just stood out for me in this moment we are living right now is the recognition that justice denied can give way to rage that burns like a furnace of fire. And um, you know, are we the reason that someone else is not getting justice? And that is such a powerful question to lean those two against one another. Should we go to Isaiah? And the Psalm <laughs> as related? That's a good that's a good way of responding to Joy's tough question. <laughs> oh. Let's well, run to Isaiah. <laughs> well, I just I uh, I think it takes some time to respond to that. Absolutely. I, I hope I hope that the listeners and the preachers sit in that question. Well, I think so. I, let and me I'll just do say the one same. Quick thing is that it it raises a question about the the binaries of well, biblical literature in general, but particularly Matthew and particularly this parable. That you're either one or the other, and one has to be preserved at all costs, and the other one's got to get not just reprimanded but burned up into the pot. You know, so there's. There's, there's some problems there if we just understand the world easily divided that way. But I like how the, the commentary on the website and what you're saying, Joy, too, also 
just opens that up because the imagery of judgment here is so severe and is so unyielding. And in my church, they love to sing, let the fires of your justice burn. And I always kind of snicker a little bit saying, I don't think we really realize what we're asking for here <laughs> in terms of what that's going to look like. You know, we've got language that we've turned into camp songs that is deathly serious language that we have to create space to talk about. And I don't know if a single sermon is the only time to do that, but, uh, but we have to, and if not now, when, and if not around texts like this, that put those images in front of us, then also when. I guess I didn't answer the question either, except this, maybe restate it. How about that, Isaiah? Move on to Isaiah. <laughs> I, I'm honestly going to say I have no idea what to do with this text from Isaiah this week. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to be, um, I'm, I'm going to take note of the fact that it feels to me like, um, we've lost sight of who God is as the source of our hope. And this for me is a good text to remember, uh, to remind us that um, there, there is no one but God uh, that we need to turn to. And that that at least has to be the particular word of the church that we point to the good the um, peace, uh, the expectation that the world is hungering for as the promise of God. And um, th where we fail, which gets us back to the, to the previous uh, text, where we fail, it sets the world on fire. And we need to take some responsibility for that. Um, but where we point to the King of Israel, the Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, as the hope, um, it, it, it can be such a promising word, even when we are, are less than we should be. Uh, that, that's how I read that this week. And I, 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 for some, that might be the word to preach. Just point to God. I, uh, that's, yeah, I, I heard it like totally opposite. <laughs> Tell I mean, I, yeah, no, that's so interesting, Joy, because I heard it, I, I heard it as, uh, who is like me and don't pretend to be me, uh, you know, or don't try to be me. Uh, and which is what we do when we, when we, uh, when we sit in on the judgment seat. Uh, and when we, you know, we decide who's in and who's out and, and who is deserving of God's judgment and who is deserving of the fires of justice or whatever, uh, that's exactly what we do. Uh, we, we put ourselves in God's position and, uh, and we make claims about, and I, I find that so fascinating with, with, with people is that when we make claims, you know, about, about, groups or people that are uh, that are self-righteous and and ha have in mind what you know how justice should be served you know what are we saying about God and it's just the ultimate it's, it's just the ultimate act of, of of hypocrisy and idolatry and I and so I just um, I so that's how I heard it joy I was just like who is like me nobody is like God so stop being God I, and that that's that's what I would that's how I would connect it. <laughs> Because that's what we try to do. Yes, because that, that's exactly it. We don't point to God. Mm -hmm. We point to ourselves. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I love this passage from Isaiah. and um, You always love Isaiah. Yeah, pretty much. That's true. It's sort of, it's sort of like Caroline and John. Uh, with, with, uh, but you're, a lot, you're the same with Isaiah. Uh, this is... A, a first of all, um, this is a this is a case I think where the pronouns that the NRSV chose chooses to use and then also to not use um, really uh, makes the makes the passage more difficult to understand. It's easier to understand if you just know Hebrew. Is what I'm trying to say. So uh, notice the the very first line. Um, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and His Redeemer. I think it's really important to note that the his there refers back to Israel. So it's, uh, this is a very, 
God is declaring God's identity as a relationship, a particular, particular relationship to this um, colonized people. Um, this is during the time of the Babylonian exile when Judah has been colonized uh, and taken away. So they're forced to live in Babylon and, and preaching to them there that the anonymous preacher we call Second Isaiah says, um, who am I? I am Israel's redeemer. I think it would be, uh, that's a literal translation, his redeemer, but, but we don't usually say in, 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 in our language, in a relationship to a people, we don't usually say his. And so we would say it's or her actually. So th thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and its redeemer. And the word redeemer is really important. Um, uh, it's goel in Hebrew, and uh, it has no uh, it has no correlate in English. Um, that is, the word goel refers to a relative who fulfills family obligation to a person in need. And depending on what the person's need was, which relative was supposed to do what ch changed. Uh, so it's really a squirrely word. Um, but there's but in this case, it's um, to declare for God to declare. Um, God's self to be Israel's goel. That relationship is that um, God is going to bring Israel back from this land of many false gods. And then that's the rest of the context. Um, a, a big feature of Second Isaiah is the ridiculing of idols and the call for anyone else who will claim to be God, particularly Israel's God, to step up and make a counterclaim. And so um, you get this, uh, I am the first, I am the last, who is like me? And then the them, let them proclaim it. It really, that's he, let him proclaim it. Let him declare, that is whatever other God would try to displace me. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, uh, one last thing about this passage. I, I would, I, I would uh, refer people to uh, the work of our retired colleague, Fred, Fred Geiser on this, that, um, uh, God says here, who is like me? And then, uh, then throughout Second Isaiah, um, that's all God can do is uh, say what I'm like as God. In this case, it's there is no other rock, no one like me. You know, that is, um, I cannot be compared to anything. I'm incomparable. And then God is always comparing God's self to a rock or, you know, these things. And so Fred has a really interesting article on that for the person who got a lot of time this week. All right. I could say more, but I won't. Well, basically, what you just said, Rolf, wouldn't you, I mean, I think this would be a good, this could also be a good place to bring in the psalm. I mean, in terms of, of, of how, you were, how you were interpreting the Isaiah passage, I mean, who is like me? And then you get these claims about, these claims about God in the psalm that like, yeah, no, I mean, like, God is a merciful and gracious God, so to, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, which I am not, <laughs> which most people aren't. And so it's a, it's a way to, you know, qualify, you know, who is like me? Well, no one, because can it, does, does any, is anybody able to embody those characteristics? Uh, no, that would be no. Um, only our God can. And so I think it could be, if, that, if that's the direction that you go with, with your sermon, I think bringing in the psalm for language around that could be really helpful. Does that, does that seem fair, Rolf? Totally. I, um, I would point people to the work uh, both uh, last week and this week and in weeks to come of Chip Bazard. Uh, doesn't usually go by Walter um, uh, as, we, as we list him uh, on the website. But uh, first of all, his incredible lengthy and detailed and highly footnoted uh, commentaries on the website are uh, entertaining and uh, a great exegesis. Um, the, the appeal here, um, the psalmist says, the insolent rise up against me, but you, O Lord, are a God, and then quotes the closest thing that the Old Testament has to a creed. Neither Israelite religion nor later rabbinical Judaism uh, are creedal uh, religions, but if there's anything close to a creed, it's that phrase. Um, the Lord, uh, God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. It's on the basis of God's character alone in the face of hostile, um, insolent enemies, ruffians, I think is the translation given here, um, 
I don't use that word often, ruffian. I'll have to try to get that into the conversation the next couple of days, just for fun. But uh, it's on the basis of God's character that the psalm appeals to God. And so, so uh, Isaiah 44 and the psalm do go well together. Uh, the, uh, the alternate or semi-continuous, semi-continuous reading, uh, I, uh, I, I just, I read that and then just immediately uh, thought, of course, about uh, church and the time of pandemic, uh, in the time of a coronavirus, uh, this coronavirus, and uh, particularly John 16, or John 16, there I go, uh, Genesis, uh, the verse 16, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it, you know, that, that we, we have, the way in which we expect God to show up in our worship and in our places of worship, and we've counted on that, and now where is it that we find God that we had not expected. And one of the things I love about this, uh, uh, about the, when I started thinking about this passage or in light of our current circumstances, I then love verse 11. When he reached a certain place, the place doesn't even have a name, of course, right? And then it has a name, but it's uh, that God is there. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that, that, uh, you know, inviting people, um, inviting people to say, where have you, where, where have your Bethels been uh, in the last, in the last few months? Where, where has, Beth, where is that certain place that you, uh, I, I, I never imagined God to show up here. And, and now this is, this is my Bethel. Uh, that's what I would do with this, this passage. I really want to encourage our listeners to consider that because it would be so easy to take this text and be happy for those who are have returned now to to uh, their uh, shared space that it, they're familiar with. But my goodness, to ask the question just as you framed it, where have you found God that you didn't expect? Because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to find God in the world. We're supposed to have this uh, glimpse. And, and what does it mean for us to have spent this time together, a uh, 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 quarantine, and to say that our homes are an awesome place where we experience the presence of God? Thank you for that. Out of all the Jacob stories, this is my favorite, which is probably, Matt, uh, Matt's going to say it's his least favorite, uh, probably, of the Jacob stories. Um, uh, I love this story because, um, first of all, the image of he lay down in that place and, and uh, you know, he had a stone for a pillow. Madeline LaEngle's book on Jacob uh, in her Genesis cycle of novels is called A Stone for a Pillow, I think is the, the one about about Jacob. And so Jacob has, Jacob is in this condition because of his own actions. Um, he has had to, he has had to flee from Esau because Esau is going to murder him. Um, and so he's out, he's got nothing, right? He's got nothing to his name except a stone. Uh, oh, by the way, he did have a little thing of oil, uh, uh, set a priest who later made up that detail so he could have him anoint the rock later. But uh, so Jacob's out there and God, God finds him in his suffering, in his lowest moment when he's got nothing. God, that's where God finds him. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the themes of the theology of the cross uh, in my construction of it is that God has promised to meet us at the lowest moments and in our suffering. And here, that's what God does for Jacob. And then the rest of the story is um, that Israel then, so God finds Jacob out there, right, in the world, in his suffering. And then Israel takes that spot and says, oh, God's here. So then they put walls around it. And it becomes uh, the sanctuary of the northern kingdom, and which gives the prophets something to rail against for the rest of Israel's history. You know, they, uh, Amos says, go to Bethel and sin, you know, uh, that... You get you get something about the human condition here that we uh, we think we can control God and box God in with with walls and that religion sometimes uh, that's you know that's where I don't believe in religion but I believe in faith you know because religion tends to do that sort of thing. 
I do love the detail that in the morning he, uh, he gets up and he reaches in inside his uh, robe and he has this little vial of anointing oil so that he can, um, uh, you know, do a religious ceremony there. It had to be detail added by a priest later and a high church priest too, by the way. A high church one. Yeah. <laughs> so Romans. Too. Matt, what about, you got to say something about Jacob, Matt. Oh, I love this story. So yeah, no, I, I like this story very much. I just, I just don't think Jacob is suffering in this story. I don't think he has nothing. He's got the blessing and now he's, he's charting off the, the, the trajectory of, of the life of the patriarchs is heading a different direction and, and God renews it. So yeah, I don't know if I, I don't think he steals the birthright either. So, you know, I got, I got a lot of, uh, a lot of battles to fight with this one. I think he takes something that Esau didn't want. And he now is, it's getting now recreated in this new thing. But I love the imagery of discovering uh, God in an unexpected place. I love the discovery of, of him marking, not just the place, not just the land, which, I mean, this is the actual land that is eventually going to be what's fought over for so long. But it's also he's marking a new insight. He's marking a new understanding now of his role in this. And so the fact that God essentially restates the covenantal promise to him is also a beautiful thing. So we're going to see what that promise looks like now in, in his hands. So I loved- think that's worth really emphasizing that the, re- the restating of the covenantal promise um, that God is confirming what's happened in the earlier stories that uh, whether he stole it or took it or whatever, he bought it. First, first, well, first the birthright. It was discounted. Then the, well, that was the birthright, but this is the blessing now. And uh, as yeah, that was a little more slippery. I, okay, I give you that. No, but but it's the blessing that really matters in Genesis, um, as Walter Brueggemann has charted the plot of Genesis. It's really about where the blessing goes, and so and so God here confirms with whatever has happened in the past and renews that, and but also renews the mission again that all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I, you know, one more thing, and then I know we need to go on, but I, uh, that the, I, I liked watching you, uh, Rolf, when you like, oh, here's this little bit of oil, you know, <laughs> it, it, it pulls out this little vial of oil and all of a sudden this becomes a holy, you know, this becomes a holy place. And it just, it just, when you were saying that, it was reminding me of, in my church, of how uh, people are taking photos of, of, their, com- of, of their communion, t- you know, their home communion tables and their, uh, the ways in which they are uh, inviting God to, to these, these spaces that, that, that in the past they never thought were holy. Uh, right, God, church is holy, but my home isn't holy, or my uh, my dinner table isn't holy, and and they're marking it with uh, they're marking those spaces with with uh, with communion. Uh, they're marking those spaces with these kinds of things that says, yes, God is here, and uh, I've just loved that seeing you know people posting uh, posting their communion where they how they've set the table for worship and. Uh, and so, the, yeah, just from when you said that, that's what made me, made me think about that. And candles and things of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And actually, that ties in, um, um, again, with what Ralph was saying, but specifically as, as dramatized, uh, as you've said, Caroline, that we don't talk much about the transforming work of God. And that's what we're, we're getting in Romans. But that's what has been uh, shown to us in God blessing Jacob. I mean, we've talked about the character of Jacob, and yet God blesses for the sake of everyone, keeping, keeping that, that, that promise uh, that only God can keep. Um, God, um, God's transforming grace is at work. And uh, that's what we see, or that's the hope that I read about as I read, uh, read in Romans. And, and I really want to believe that, I really want to believe that the people of God called Christian can um, allow ourselves to be transformed again so that we can be evidence of that hope in the world, despite uh, what we are rightly accused of.
I've got a question for, uh, especially for uh, Matt and Caroline, but uh, also for Joy. Um, and that is, so you've got this uh, language about the creation being su uh, subjected to futility in here and that creation itself um, is in bondage to dec decay and all of creation it has been groaning in labor pains. Um, is, is this, is Paul's doctrine of sin or of, of, the, of, what, of the human condition, does that encompass not just humanity, but all then of creation? It's hard to know how to answer that just because he has so little to say about creation. I mean, the word catissus here that we see is rarely used in Paul's writings. He, we got new creation, but here's a place where he speaks about the wider creation. So we really don't have a whole lot to go on except for this. But there is this sense that whatever, whatever he means by creation, that it has been subjected and the subject of the subjecting there, I think is pretty obviously God, that God as well has subjected the creation, which Beverly Gaventa and her work on Romans argues back to chapter one about God handing them over, handing over humanity to its lusts or its idolatries or its, its rebelliousness so that it might be redeemed. Now there's all sorts of things we want to talk about there, but that's, that's Paul's theological logic here, where the creation itself somehow participates in that, not subjected out of a sense of hatred or a punishment, but subjected so that it too might be redeemed. So the way in which human redemption is intertwined with creation's redemption, and again, I don't know if Paul means the natural world the way we, we might talk about that today, but it's pretty close. It is significant. The, the problem with the world is beyond just the fact that I sin too much. The problem with the world is one of, of powers that have seized control over what God created to be good and has, has used that for its own. Those powers have used what they've taken over for their own, like a theological colonizing almost, right? In the ways of taking, 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 enlisting us in their evil service and so on and so forth. So next week, Paul will answer back to those powers later on in chapter eight. Does that answer the question? I, I, but I think it is this idea of a bigger system. And so creation groans, creation suffers, creation longs, just like we do, just like the spirit does. That was a long answer. Caroline and Joy might want to say more too. I don't know. Well, I, I was going to say that it's, uh, it's the way in which, I think it's indicative of the way in which Paul imagines God's, you know, God's presence in Jesus as a, as a creation altering event. Uh, it's a cosmic event. And so this is where, uh, this is where sort of Paul's cosmology kind of gets languaged, I think. And, and I couldn't help but then go to, uh, you know, the end of Galatians where in Christ there's new creation, you know, it's, uh, and so that, 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 yeah, that I think what Matt said that it's not it's not just about a you know a transformation of of individuals and peoples, but it's this it's a, it's a it's a cosmic a reorientation of 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 God's world, God reconciling God the the entire world to God's self, and so I think uh, that's how I hear this passage in particular of what's at stake cosmologically for God.